In today's conversation, I am joined by Jonathan Allen, who is the enterprise strategist for Amazon Web Services. And what we want to talk about is digital transformation. And we will look at some of the latest technology trends. We will look at how Amazon itself has digitally transformed and how some of the customers of Amazon have used this technology as well as some of the key lessons learned and a look into the future. So, Alan, thank you so much for joining me. Hey, great to be here, Bernard. Thank you for inviting me. Um, maybe for anyone watching or listening, maybe you can give us a little overview of what you do at AWS and, and what, what Amazon Web Services is as well. Sure. So uh, the Enterprise Strategy is a small global team in Amazon Web Services. Um, we are all ex-CTOs or CIOs who have led a significant transformation to AWS and bring our own lessons learned of that and are able to really work with other executives around the world with experiential empathy of the situations they're facing right now as they move forward. Certainly on my own journey, one of the things back in 2014 I found myself doing is reaching out to other executives who had gone through the transformation and really starting the questions with, so how did you? And mm. we often find that experiential empathy um, is incredibly rewarding and engaging. So over the last uh, nearly four years, I've had the privilege of working um, with going on 500 different customers around the world and helping them with their own transformations and journey uh, mm. to use Amazon Web Services. Very good. So let's look into into digital transformation of Amazon itself. So how, you are obviously transforming your own organization. You're using technology like cloud and AI really well as an organization. Maybe you can share with us your your own digital transformation journey and some of the the highlights from that from that. Well, there's some very interesting lessons learned when you go back through it. So, you know, Amazon was actually incorporated on July the 5th, 1994, by obviously Jeff Bezos. And in the early years, obviously, lots of experimentation, books played a massive and significant part. Um, post the dot-com boom, though, um, obviously, Amazon came through that. Um, the teams were still innovating. But actually, um, speed became a problem for us. And one of our key leadership principles, these are leadership principles that Amazonians around the world use every single day, is bias for action. And we started to slow down. And speed matters greatly. Jeff has spoken about this on many times. And when Andy Jassy and Jeff and other, other leaders went and spoke to the teams, what they realized was a lot of the teams were spending months building the same building blocks, you know, storage, mm -hmm. network, compute, databases, load balancers, before they even got to building and actually solving the customer problem. And at the time, Jeff, uh, Andy, and actually the CIO of the time, Rick Dalzell, who's spoken uh, on stage about this journey, um, realized that they needed to both change both their organization and solve this recurring problem of continually solving the same problems of actually just establishing that base infrastructure. Mm. And what you saw from that was actually a number of things. The first was obviously organization. So Jeff coined this term, two pizza teams. So how are we organizing ourselves within the business is probably the most important lesson learned. And a two pizza team really means that a team can be fed by two pizzas. Uh, we're talking Chicago sized pizzas here, which typically means anything I find from four to 10 people. I have seen them as large as 12 people, though that's a little rare. Basically, what you're looking for is to keep the number of conversations, the number of connections that have got to be maintained within that team to a good size. Um, and we found that these two pizza teams work really well. But then that team has got to be responsible for building their customers and innovating for their customers. And that really means building and supporting their own technology. And that was a major organizational breakthrough. And then what followed was how do we solve this repeated challenge of teams having to solve the same infrastructure challenges? So for Amazon in the early days, what you saw was Andy Jassy with a number of other leaders, Andy Jassy now our, our chief executive officer, started to go away, um, actually with just 57 uh, folks in the early days, and start to build some of these base services 
Um, the first one actually that launched in beta was actually the Simple Queue service back in 2006, um, swiftly followed by the Amazon S3 service, the Simple Storage service, also in 2006, which went generally available. And they were the first services. And since then, obviously, we've established um, over 175 services that both Amazon and millions of customers are using around the world. Mm. But coming back to Amazon's transformation, the second thing after the two pizza teams and these teams then building these common building blocks was really the use of APIs. You know, this obviously this application programming interface um, has really been revolutionary, not only for companies to talk to each other, but inside of Amazon, each team, they produce their own hardened or potentially externalizable API, which each team can also use. So again, they're not having to say solve the same problems. And that, with the continual innovation uh, of Amazon and these small teams, um, is, is ultimately innovated to, to where you see now with Amazon with over a million uh, customers around the world. So, and, and this obviously, I, th I think what, what Amazon realized early on is that data is such a, a key ingredient for business success. And I guess this came with the, the data sharing man mandate that, 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 Jeff Bezos actually imposed on the organization that actually we want APIs. We want to make sure that that everyone is collecting data, but makes it shareable, gives everyone else access to it. And then I guess your your flywheel approach to um, to to AI implementation as well, right? Yeah, and it's it's interesting when you talk about that. So Jeff, in the early days, you know, did ask that all teams, um, uh, when appropriate can ask, access other data through APIs. There's no direct access to data stores for Teams, when appropriate, obviously. Um, but I, I think the big revolution, and this comes up a lot in my conversations with the customers, Bernard, is um, a lot of people almost go, right, we need to um, look at building a data lake, and a data lake can absolutely be pivotal. Uh, and we have tens of thousands of data lakes running on S3. But actually, what I find in the conversations with customers and, and what was really a revelation to me coming into Amazon was the individual data matters massively and that rolls up. And I'll give you an example. Um, every Amazonian, um, she or he, will understand what are their key customer success metrics they're dealing with and they will track how that's going who they're speaking to. And that data will then feed into probably one of our most, two of our most powerful mechanisms. One is which are, is our working backwards process for how we um, invent in Amazon. And in this working backwards process, we always work backwards from a customer problem, always. And then you mentioned the flywheel there. Um, in that flywheel, you know, we're looking typically to reduce prices, uh, to improve choice and improve speed. And bringing those three things together with that working backwards, when you create this, what we call our working backwards document, which actually starts with an internal press release of actually how you're gonna solve the problem and the benefit for the customer, that is littered with data. And it's that data, sometimes in its most basic form, not even when you're looking at going to a data warehouse, that actually starts the momentum of making these decisions on behalf of customers. So yes, um, Obviously, teams being able to access their own data um, and to other teams' data through an API, an incredibly port, important part of the construct when appropriate. But also taking data back to its basic form um, is also incredibly important. And my conversation with customers, when you talk them through some of this, they're like, yes, you're right. We don't actually even know what our data is. We've assumed it's all hidden away in these hundreds and hundreds of databases um, that sometimes are, you know, are under a very careful lock and key for all the obvious reasons. But sometimes it actually starts with the very simple things in Teams and how they invent. Very good. We, and, and this leads us nicely to, to you, you mentioned customers and the conversations you have with your own, with, with your own customers. Obviously, Amazon Web Services uh, is enabling other organizations to digitally transform by offering cloud services, by offering artificial intelligence as a service, functionality, and so on. So um, maybe you can share with us some of your, your favorite customer success stories. Let me, let me share some of them. But let's, let's, let me also just sort of take a step back and just... Um talk probably for, for 10 seconds about what, what we talk about when we say cloud computing and yeah. what Amazon Web Services is as well. So when you look at how typically over the last um, 
20 to 30 years of actually businesses running, a couple of things I found to be very true. One, they've typically been using waterfall processes for projects. And part of those waterfall processes has been leveraging um, traditional on-premise technology um, to and very often very siloed teams looking after this very bespoke technology as they move forward. And what we've seen over um, arguably in this thing that we call the digital age since I, and actually I see the digital age is starting in around about 1995 when the first internet service providers came online. Mm -hmm. um, and I, in fact, I see the internet as one of these general purpose technologies. Um, we've then seen the evolution of RESTful APIs. I'd say that's another GPT. Mm -hmm. You've then seen the revolution of cloud technology um, launching uh, by AW, you know, Amazon Web Services in 2006. Um, we've seen another a general purpose technology emerge, in my opinion, with machine learning, now mm -hmm. available as a service in 2018 with, with SageMaker. And what's happened, I think, you know, over this time is suddenly when people take a look at some of these, uh, these general purpose technologies, particularly when they look at cloud computing, they're like, well, instead of me having to make tens of millions, sometimes billions of dollars of investment and capital expenditure, which has an extremely long lead time to actually get the result you want, you're now faced with the possibility that I can use variable expense and actually get to uh, near unlimited computing power, storage, data processing, machine learning tools, all available um, pay as you go in 24 regions around the world. Um, and that's been incredibly attractive to organizations over the last 14 years. And it started, of course, with the unicorns that started. Mm -hmm. But over the last six, eight years, we've seen suddenly this um, very broad adoption from thousands and thousands of enterprise customers. In fact, we now have over a million Amazon Web Services customers that are now leveraging um, cloud technology to really change from this waterfall traditional approach to this much more um, agile, humanistic approach um, delivering and innovating for their customers um, with these GPTs, with actually this cloud technology at the heart of it. Very good. That that and 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 for companies that has really changed the entire ball game, I, I think they can now apply machine learning um, with a click of a button, basically, instead of building the competencies and the technology themselves. So, a huge advantage. Yeah, it, it makes it accessible. And, you know, when you look at machine learning in the conversations I've had and, and actually the work I've done, um, it's still early days, actually, for, for companies with machine learning. Um, these, you know, a lot of enterprises, um, you know, many have now completed their migration to AWS, but some are still getting going. The idea of actually even doing machine learning on premise is almost like an anathema to them, Bernard. And it is available as a click of a button, but it's it's worth just exploring um, some of the choices and some of the of, of why machine learning and the need to bring machine learning in has accelerated things. So if you kind of, and I know you've written a lot about this, but you know, the customers I speak to, when you strip away much of the noise around artificial intelligence and deep learning and machine learning, machine learning actually really helps you solve two problems. When you can't use logic to solve a problem where one plus one doesn't equal two, you need actually something to make an inferred decision for you, or you can't provide unlimited human resources to look at something. And they're the two elements, they're the two challenges where machine learning can now come in and help customers solve a problem. Um, and that's really interesting. And that's really where you look at Amazon Web Services offers three different approaches for customers, depending on where they want to operate. On the lowest level, you've got the, the frameworks for the machine learning specialists. These are where they want to work directly with maybe PyTorch or MSNet or TensorFlow. And we provide all the compute available for them to do that. Or you've got the middle layer where they just want to have it as a click service with SageMaker. And they want to be able to um, test training models they want to curate the data they want to bring it and by the way in my experience a ton of the time is in the data curation which mm -hmm. is why yesterday you saw a lot of announcements on how we can help um, speed that up 
And then finally, you've got those services where even not even a click, you just want to be able to consume it as an API. Um, and I just want a decision and that could be with something as translation service or uh, video recognition service and bring it in as a service. So really three different offerings depending on um, what customers want to do. And them to be able to use these offerings again in their agile teams to help solve a problem to tr use a data set to train a machine learning model and then to use that trained data to make an inference continually for them um, has become actually very critical to a massive number of organizations. Mm. You refer to yesterday. Yesterday was the, the kick of, the, of, of your re-event uh, conference, which is the, 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 the big event where you launch new, new um, technologies, new solutions, new services. What were some of the, the key announcements from, from yesterday that you, you would highlight? Well, the two that got me most interested um, and excited um, was, was actually what is actually a pretty, it seems simple, but isn't simple. And that's actually something that we call strongly consistent S3 storage. What do I mean by that? Well, um, one of the problems that enterprises have had for many years is ensuring that their data is up to date. Um, and when they come to access it, there's not any new data been written to it. Um, and actually Amazon Web Services, when you look at our regions uh, around the world, these 24 regions um, that have 77 availability zones, um, our regions are different to other people's. We have this concept where each region will have an availability zone um, that is up to 100 kilometers away from another availability zone with two transit centers within that. And within these availability zones, we have this service called the Simple Storage Service, Amazon S3. And this is a very powerful object storage, um, which now hosts well over 10,000 uh, data lakes from customers on it. But the ability to have your data um, strongly consistent across all of those availability zones is a crucial feature for customers. And that was one big announcement, um, especially for reliability, which is so key for all of our customers. And the second one that really caught my attention was um, AWS Proton. And Proton is this fully managed uh, deployment service for container and serverless. And again, what this does is brings together all of the concepts for DevOps. And why that caught my attention, Bernard, is as I work with customers around the world, um, this move to almost two pizza teams, these DevOps teams that build and support, it takes time. And very often they've had a central infrastructure team that has looked after this on-premise technology. And very often this team actually ends up becoming the, the DevOps team, mm -hmm. which actually, if you look at what Patrick Dubois named it as, and, and you look at some of the books um, out there, um, DevOps is how you do something, not an individual team, um, according to the, you know, the word. But actually, this is a journey of, of progress for teams. They don't just you know, double click overnight and suddenly they're DevOps teams. And very often people are looking for consistent, strongly consistent standards of how they build their applications, deploy their data, continually deploy them to making sure they've got the right versions. And what AWS Proton does is allow the central teams to um, make available um, through Proton continually consistent environments available for their teams to develop on. So really exciting announcement yesterday, um, lo really looking to see what customers do with it. Good, so talking about customers then, what are some of your favorite customer use cases, customer transformation stories that really highlight what, what organizations can now do with the technologies you've, you've just mentioned? Yeah, there's, there's many, but I wanted to sort of, I wanted to focus on three or four, um, you know, today, and, and we can deep dive on, on, on any of them. Um, I think time's going to be against us to deep dive on them all, but let's mm -hmm. just sort of do, do a, a little bit. of. We, we, we can always do another session to deep okay. dive into each of those. <laughs> Well, we should we should get one of the customers to come and speak about it themselves with you, Bernard. Um, what um, the three or four that I've worked on that really spring to mind though um, in Marsat um, is a really interesting story. Obviously, provide global connectivity services and, and a British uh, headquartered service. Um, what BP have done over the last few years really springs to mind. I had the privilege of working with them very early on in my tenure at Amazon Web Services. Um, Dunhill. Uh, what Dunilm have actually done with uh, Amazon Web Services, obviously Dunilm um, have this this mission to make uh, your home uh, beautiful. And, so they're, uh, yeah, they're, they're, done... just, just for anyone that doesn't know the brand, it's a, a, a home retailer, furnishing and accessories. 
Yep. Yeah. And then finally, um, obviously, I spend a lot of my time with financial services. And I think what Goldman Sachs have done over the last few years, um, uh, leveraging cloud technology to power uh, their business, particularly uh, their new Marcus uh, business and the new um, Apple credit card um, is remarkable. Mm. Um, so, you know, let's just take a sort of a, a quick step on, on some of these, uh, some of these journeys. Um, the Inmarsat uh, example was really interesting. Um, Tim Brown actually um, spoke for us. Tim Brown's their cloud and infrastructure operations director, and he spoke at our last Transformation Day um, in 2019 on stage about their migration journey. Um, going from five data centers into the cloud. Really remarkable progress. Um, they set themselves up with a, a first proof of concept of going to the cloud. Um, we had the privilege of, of working with them, sharing um, our methodology of executing a large-scale migration to AWS. And I had the privilege of doing the breakout session at reInvent this, this year again on that session. And really taking the, the methods and patterns that we've established uh, and the mental models and the program kits and helping them, first of all, do a proof of concept and then very quickly moving from proof of concept to actually move 10% of their workloads uh, by February 2019. Uh, and then the confidence from that to move, I think, another 55% uh, up to February 2020 this year. Really a very rapid migration, remarkable story. Um, and the thing that was most key to them when Tim talks about it was to get to this pace of innovation, these, this, this continual innovation that Amazon and Amazon Web Services offers to its customers. Again, all these two pizza teams continually focusing on what they do and, and building and inventing for their customers. So in Moss, that's a great story. And then obviously onto BP, who actually started their journey in 2013. Um, moving their, first of all, their digital assets, the, the internet facing um, parts of their business uh, to the internet. Mm -hmm. And then really starting in 2016 to look at actually how can they um, look to move some of their, what they call mega data centers um, into the cloud and be cloud first. And very important for them was the sustainability angle um, of, of, of cloud computing. Um, when you look at some of the reports that IDC have produced, um, typically we see that there's a three and a half times uh, benefit uh, on the sustainability output of using cloud computing, um, which is very fascinating to our customers and actually become, in my experience with executive committees, a very central and strong theme mm. um, to the, everything they operate at the present time. Um, through to BP last year at 2019, you know, um, choosing to use AWS uh, to close their European mega data centers, um, which was a remarkable journey for them that they're still on, um, including as part of that journey, uh, moving 32 uh, mission critical SAP instances onto AWS. Um, so remarkable journey for them. Um, all the way through to, as I mentioned, Goldman Sachs, um, who spoke on stage again at reInvent with us um, last year uh, and in 2018, um, a gentleman called Roy Joseph sp uh, spoke to us. And a key part of their journey, of course, with any FSI is to probe extremely deeply into the security uh, and reassure themselves um, that security is absolutely job zero for his here at AWS, um, but also um, helping us actually um, develop something called Bring Your Own Key back in 2017, 2018, which allows them and, and any customer to actually own the encryption key for their data. Um, an incre incre you know, incredibly important, important part of that journey. Mm -hmm. uh, through to in 2019, 2020, obviously building and launching the Apple um, credit card using Goldman Sachs and obviously offering Marcus, um, which as of uh, 12 months ago had over 50 billion of retail deposits running on it. Fascinating. In your introduction, you mentioned Dunelms, um, the retailer. I, I don't want to, I'm quite intrigued to see what, what the story was there. Yeah, so Dunelm were actually operating a, a pretty large web sphere estate, uh, and they were running um, into some barriers with that product. And they actually took a, um, what we call um, a very forward serverless approach to development. Serverless. Um, when you look at it, it really means that um, it's, the, it's probably the highest abstraction away from a, from a compute, which really means I've got my compute, uh, sorry, I've got my code and I've got my data, uh, and I just want you to run the code and, and look after the data for me. 
So what we offer uh, within AWS is um, what we call our Lambda code execution environment, um, supporting a large number of languages. And you can place your business logic, your code into Lambda. Uh, you can place your data into S3. You can bring in machine learning as, as either an API or, or a, using SageMaker and actually very rapidly transform uh, and bring your new ideas to life. And in fact, Dunham have talked about bringing some of their ideas to life in just hours by some of their engineers and developers working very closely with their business partners mm -hmm. and taking and writing a little bit of business logic um, and, and actually coming up with a microservice. And in fact, they've referred to it as cheating uh, because it's so easy to then publish a service. And what you've seen now is them move a lot of their services now into this um, serverless landscape of tooling available in AWS and really migrated a real clip. And interestingly, when you hear them speak about it, one of the most interesting things was their ability to actually attract new talent. Um, you get known for executing on the journey. And I, and I found this myself on my own journey. Um, when I was going through this, I was like, right, I want to recruit. Um, I want to recruit the, the, the best graduates I can find. And I want to get this cloud skill. And actually, until you've done some of it, you're in a chicken and egg situation. Because if you're not known for it, you can't actually mm -hmm. recruit the people you want to recruit. Mm -hmm. So one of the things Dunham spoke about was once they get known for this, obviously engineers and developers talk in the community at length about the things they're doing and the opportunities they're seeing and the, and the work and the products they're creating. So what Dunham also saw was it actually greatly affected their ability and improved their ability to, to attract new talent. Mm -hmm. and, and just moving away from retail, I see this around the world, by the way, in the financial services industry. You know, when you strip away a lot of the financial services industry, what you actually find at the heart of it is a large number of mathematicians doing quantitative analytics. And those quantitative uh, analytics folks are at university um, using cloud. They're using all of the APIs. They're typically, if you're a quantitative analytics person coming out of university, you're using R and the language for R to do a lot of your statistical reasoning. So they want to join an enterprise where they can keep running with that same mm. tool set and the same innovation. So this is now actually, um, in, in effect, this, this battle for talent is also another angle which is driving people to, to move away from their traditional um, ways of working and to actually move to the cloud at ever increasing speeds. Very good. Let's look at some of the, the lessons learned then, both from, from your own journey within Amazon, but also what you're seeing with the, the vast amount of customers you're interacting with every every day. Um, what would you say are some of the, the key lessons you have learned, they have learned, and what would be some of your top tips to, to make sure this, that, that this whole digital transformation journey goes smoothly? Mm. Well, Andy Jassy spoke about eight of them, and, and what I was just going to, you know, very quickly do is go through the eight, Bernard, but also share, put some 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 richer context on them from my own conversations around the world with different organisations. So, mm. so Andy spoke about the first one, the leadership will to invent and reinvent, and that came through really clearly. And you know, from my own experience working, you know, for seventeen years with a bank, and um, you know, the bank I worked for was Capital One, um, a very uh, strong will in Capital One came from Rich Fairbank and Rob Alexander that they wanted to change how they were doing things. Mm. Um, that what get us here won't get us there and we need to change. Mm. And this is really difficult for leaders because they've often been extremely successful doing what they've done to get to their existing role. So this leadership will to actually go, I need to skate to where the hockey puck is going, mm. not where it is right now is huge. And I spend a lot of my time working with CIOs, CTOs, and then very often working with CEOs and executive committees, when they realize that actually, it's not a technology problem. It's how we actually work as a business that has changed. Mm -hmm. And we need to get really good at leveraging all these different general purpose technologies, which I know you write heavily about. The, the world has changed massively in the mm -hmm. next 14 years. And by the way, it's going to change again in the next 14 years in a massive mm -hmm. way. So that's the first one. The second one, you know, Andy called it the acknowledgement that you can't fight gravity. And um, very often this I find um, is a problem in organizations with, with, with what we call the frozen middle. 
and, and, I, and I've experienced this myself. This is typically um, some of the middle managed le leaders um, who probably are running some of those existing silos of, of technology on premise. As they can, as they have previously, and and that's what they know, and that's what they do, and um, look, it, it's tough. Humans have an innate desire for stability, <laughs> you know, and continually challenging ourselves to go. No, the world has changed. The only constant is change, and I need to pivot through it. Is incredibly important. And what I say to people on the second one, and a lot of infrastructure teams and application teams, is it's a lot more exciting when you're working really close to your customers, dealing with business logic, data, machine learning, uh, maybe the interface, whether it's programmatic or human, that's a really exciting place to be. Not upgrading hardware in a data center at three o'clock in the morning. That's not a fun place to be. Uh, so don't fight gravity is, is the second lesson there. And Bernard, jump in on any of these if you want to. Um, the third one is talent that's hungry to invent. And in Amazon, we massively over-index on hiring builders. And, and when we interview people, it's what we're really looking for. And I think this ability to recognize um, that building and solving your customer problems um, is how you continually innovate and move forward. Um, that's incredibly important. Um, let's never be happy with the status quo, because again, the only constant is change. So that's sort of lesson three. Um, and then step Yeah, and I, I've, I've always loved this, this whole customer obsession as 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 you put it in amazon I, I think it's vital if you can't go massively wrong if you really think okay how can we make the life of our customers easier how can we solve customer problems how can we add some real value and if this is the starting point for your digital transformation then i think this is a, a solid starting point that will drive success yeah it, and, and and you know that it plays through in in uh everything that every Amazonian does. But it's one of the most interesting lessons learned that I share with people, by the way, is um, in Amazon, everybody is encouraged to think about their customers, to have ideas, but they're mm. also encouraged to work backwards from those ideas. And if you're trying to do something where you've not solved that customer problem and actually got a quote from a customer on what's you know what they're looking for, you're gonna struggle with that idea. So yeah, that customer obsession and hiring builders that can solve that problems is massively important. And that mm. links into, into the fourth one Andy talks about, which is solving real customer problems with builders. So I think sometimes there's a propensity to put technology before the customer. And you just, it just doesn't work in my experience. You've got to actually have, what is the customer context? What is the customer challenge mm. that you're trying to solve? And it's interesting when people say, oh, we need to do something with machine learning. I'm like, but what's the problem you're trying to solve? Right? What is it you're trying to do? Coming back to those two principles I shared earlier, is, which is if you can't use logic to solve a problem, if you need an inferred decision, or you can't scale with a million humans to solve a problem, um, can machine learning, can we train a computer model to help with that? And again, just being aware um, of the art of the possible is really important there. Yeah, and, then, and I, I couldn't agree more. I think, I again, especially when you talk about some of the latest technologies, I always feel that there's sometimes an approach driven by the fear of missing out that you think, okay, we need mm -hmm. to apply machine learning. We need to use blockchain because they are some of the latest tech trends. We need to use virtual reality. And actually, as you said, it, it is absolutely vital that you start with your own strategy, with your own business problems with your customer challenges and 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 this will then that that should then drive whatever you decide to to use it, it absolutely does now very often people want to go faster on that journey and they want mm -hmm. to enable their teams to get to that journey faster and that's where we see people migrating and choosing to do to execute a large-scale migration because they actually mm -hmm. want to take all of that human time that's currently been focused on some of those old activities and have that focusing on those customer problems mm -hmm. and that's what rightly why people want to uh, migrate and get that cost saving in both human and you know fixed expense and move to a variable expense as well um, Andy talked a lot about speed and it really does matter and and very often sometimes um, you know some some leaders I speak to just go well this is the way it, it is it's going to take us two years and I'm like hmm, you haven't really got two years you know <laughs> The, the, the pace of, of the world is changing in such a rate, you know, this, unfortunately, this year has accelerated a number of, uh, of changes, good and, and, and not so good. Mm. And, um, you know, time matters, speed matters in, mm. in business. 
Uh, and very often what I say to leadership teams is um, go and look at your teams and see which teams are blocked because some other team or something is stopping them move forward. And just get a list of those blockages because when you look at what is that box one activity, it's right there. Mm. That's when teams are blocked, particularly when you've moved to agile working. And if a team is, if an agile team is blocked, that's when you know you've got a lot of work to do. Um, mm. and, and normally it's because some sort of matrix resourcing or some sort of key technology or some sort of policy needs executive focus to look at it. Mm. Um, number six is, is, don't, is don't complexify. Andy talks about, um, I, I agree with him here. Having worked with a lot of architecture teams around the world, if you, if you, you know, when architects have 10 choices, they'll probably take 10 months to look at them all. Um, so make some, make some bold, um, predominant choices mm. uh, in what you want to go forward with. Try and keep it simple. Um, in that regard. Um, and Andy also talks about using the platform, uh, you know, with the, the broadest set and deepest set of tools to allow you to do that. So mm. you're not having to chop and change everywhere. And then finally, you know, pulling everything together with the aggressive top down goal, hugely, hugely important. Um, you know, my alma mater, um, the CIO stood on stage in, in 2015 uh, and declared that you know Amazon Web Services was going to be our predominant cloud partner in front of you know forty thousand people. It was a bold, bold goal. Mm. And what you've seen in the last few months is my alma mater achieve that. Mm. So these bold business goals really do matter to people. So there are some of my uh, top lessons learned with an introspection from Andy. From Very Andy. good. Very good. And and yeah, I I can only I I would sign every 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 one of those eight, I, th I think they're, they're vital for, for any digital transformation journey. Um, in terms of looking into the future, then, if you look ahead, what would be your, your predictions in terms of how businesses are going to change? What are some of the technologies that, that you see um, on the horizon that you are getting excited about, that you start talking to your customers about? Um, basically, if you put your little futurist head on and say, what, 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 what do I expect to happen in the next few years? And, and what, what's the role of technology? What would you say? Yeah, we, you know, as Amazonians, we get asked this a lot, Bernard. And, and I've also watched Jeff Bezos take this question a lot. And, and here's how Jeff looks at it. You know, it's actually easier to look at what's not going to change over the next 10 years, <laughs> right? Like, as humans, are we going to want to pay more money for things? No. Are, are we going to want things slower? No. Are we going to want, you know, more more choice? Yes. So what are those constants as you, as you look forward? And then the really important thing as futurologists, and this isn't Amazon talk about this, but when you listen to futurologists and Bernard, I'd put you in, in that, uh, in that category as well. A lot of, a lot of, a lot of futurologists talk about these next GPTs that are on the horizon that could change things. Um, you know, obviously quantum computing was one of these things. And last year you saw the announcement of, of bracket as a service and, um, that, uh, that's, that's huge. Um, and obviously we continue to look at, look at that. Um, but I think focusing on what's not going to change is, is far more important actually. Um, and that's, that's what I tell to people as they look at the future. Um, and, and by the way, just keep working backwards from customer problems. There are an immense amount of problems, um, in this world and all of them are opportunities. Very good. So this, the, the last the, two, tw 2020 has seen massive changes, obviously for, for everyone, huge transformations, a, a real push in terms of accelerated digital adoption of, of technologies like cloud, like AI and others. Um, do, do you see all of this? Do, do you see the pace staying the same? Do you, do you feel that over the next few years this will accelerate or will we will it more solidify some of the things that we've, we've started to, to, to put in place? You know, as Andy talked about yesterday, we've almost seen a, a several years of acceleration mm. um, towards cloud computing adoption uh, as a consequence of this year. And I, and I will wholeheartedly agree with that. Um, I think what is interesting to me, um, I've done a number of CIO roundtables recently, and they're talking about doing things in four weeks that they thought would have taken four years. Mm. 
um, some of the customers in, in particular one of the most one of the most interesting examples to me has been um, some customers that suddenly found themselves with contact centers um, and they couldn't put people in them anymore you know mm -hmm. they had thousands tens of thousands of of, uh, of of employees sitting in contact centers next to each other and suddenly they realized we can't do this anymore mm -hmm. actually people need to work from home we need to give them a laptop we need to give them a headset and our existing you know uh technology won't allow us to do it now telephony projects based on my experience are sometimes three four year events and what you saw was this suddenly an entire focus from the executive committee down going we need to change this and sure enough you know we saw you know um hundreds of customers suddenly actually we need amazon connect to help us with this we need that contact center in a cloud uh, we need to actually have a reliable secure uh, stable voice connection uh, for associates to be at home so suddenly you know within days um, you've seen customers have this up and running within two weeks you've seen then thousands of agents running from from home and that's been fascinating to me that actually you know necessity tends to be the mother of invention in these things and suddenly you know the will comes very clear very good thank you so much for your time today i i could carry on talking to you about all of these fascinating topics for hours uh, but i i think we need to find uh, uh, another time to deep dive into some of the customer stories maybe so thank you very much for your time um for anyone watching this on youtube or listening to it as a podcast uh, there's a lot more of those conversations subscribe to my channel or have a or subscribe to my podcast thank you very much thank you bernard